Okay, so uh, just a, a couple of uh, words for my presentation. So, uh, as just said, I'm professor of geochemistry, so I'm really, uh, by training, a geoscientist. I, have a, I was trained in geology, actually, and I came back to geochemistry during my uh, PhD uh, thesis uh, that I never quit, actually. Uh, and more specifically, I've been working on the chemistry of uh, rivers in particular large rivers, so I've spent a lot, quite a lot of time on, on looking at the Amazon, large rivers like the Congo or Chinese rivers uh, to try to uh, interpret them in terms of, of uh, uh, chemical composition and water discharge. And progressively I came into this notion of critical zone that I'm going to detail today. Um, because I needed uh, uh, interdisciplinary corpus to interpret my research that I, I was not able to find. So in a way, uh, I got uh, the chance to meet people and it was a kind of a global opportunity of merging disciplines to come up with this notion of critical zone, which is two things. It's one, one uh, zone of the planet. I'm going to detail that in a minute. But it's also a way of doing science. And uh, like 10 years ago, I met a French philosopher that you know probably, which is Bruno Latour. Uh, he went to my office and he said, oh, you're working on critical zone. Could you explain it to me what it is? And then this is the beginning of a long uh, and fr fruitful uh, collaboration with him and a number of people. So I got, uh, and I'm still surprised of that, uh, the way social sciences and politics political sciences are interested by this concept of critical zone. So I'm going to try today to essentially to talk about the scientific concept. Uh, I hope it's not going too much into scientific details, but I think it's important to know where does the concept come from. And, and then I will finish by the political aspects of this notion, uh, which is basically the way um, social sciences, arts and political science are interested uh, by this concept and the way it can change the way uh, we make uh, Earth politics. And to int introduce uh, the subject, uh, let me start by a quotation, uh, of by which is uh, one of Bruno Latour's quotation, and which is the front page of a book that you can eventually uh, buy. It's a big, it's an expensive and, and really heavy book but it's an interesting book which is called Critical Zones. And let, let us read the, the, the sentence. You want to learn on Earth, so land to, on Earth, why? Because we are hanging in mid-air, headed for a crash. How is it down there? It's pretty tense. A war zone? Close. A critical zone, a few kilometers thick, where everything happens. It is, is it habitable? Depends on your chosen science. Uh, will I survive down there? Depends on your politics. So it's, it's summarizing, it's, it's in a way, what is uh, the topic of today's uh, seminar. So I will come back on that book at the end of the, of the seminar, but uh, it's, it's a catalog of an exhibition, which is still uh, running in the ZKM, which is a Centrum Kunst und, uh, für Kunst und Medien in Germany, in Karlsruhe. And you can go there and visit, it's still uh, open until I think end of January uh, and you can see a lot of things on the critical zone concept, not only scientific uh, aspects but also art, artistic, philosophical and, and uh, uh, social science uh, aspects. So what I'm going to do today is to uh, spend some time on this concept. Where does it come from? What is it, the critical zone? Uh, uh, what does it change to our uh, view on the, on the Earth? Uh, and I'm going to show you that it's basically a conflict zone, a buffer zone between the, the energy from the sun and the energy from the deep earth. That's really, really a border. And, and then I will try to uh, show you how scientists uh, get organized to develop a critical zone science, which is, let's say, a holistic science on that thin pellicle of the earth. And then we, we will end up uh, quite rapidly, because I am not a philosopher, I am not a politician, a science, political science people, guy, person. What does it change us to the Earth's politics in the Anthropocene? And it's changed a lot. 
So let's start by the, uh, the first part. So let me give you very simply the definition. So the definition was uh, given by one of the US, United States, uh, National Council for Research. So it's a high council which is deciding upon the priorities of the country in terms of scientific fundings. Uh, the concept of critical zone was proposed by this committee to uh, denote the skin of the earth, the zone which is comprised between the sky, okay, let's say the sky, and the rocks which are beneath our feet. Uh, and it's critical because this is where life is actually on the planet. Um, and it's critical to better understand it, to predict our future. So if you think a little bit of that, actually, and, and, and at contrario with what the uh, old, you know, the modernity has teach us, we're not living on the planet. We're not living on the globe, actually. Okay, this famous globe that uh, you have probably in mind, the Earth rise, the photography of the Earth, you know, from, taken from the moon during the, during the special uh, exploration in the 70s. But this is a misleading image of the, of, the, of the Earth we're living in. We're not living on that planet. We're living on a very thick zone at the surface of this planet. Nobody is walking in the ocean. Nobody is walking in the upper atmosphere. Nobody is walking in the deep mantle of the Earth just because this is not habitable. So the, the critical zone is the habitable zone uh, of the planet. So it's a mix of different entities, compart what I will call compartments, that exchange matter and energy. So if you want to study that in terms of, uh, of scientific um, problems, you need to uh, look at the exchanges of matter and energy. By definition, because this is a question you may ask, uh, the, by definition this concept is terrestrial. The critical zone is only uh, in, in, in uh, what I'm going to talk about, represented on the terrestrial surfaces. But we can discuss, and I, want to, I, don't want to have, I don't have the time to go into this today, but we can discuss to know whether the, the, the bottom of the ocean or the ocean as a whole could also be uh, considered as a critical zone. So I keep it as a terrestrial concept for, for today. So it's typically, from the political point of view, an hybrid, okay? And, and this is something which is, can be studied by both natural scientists and social scientists. And it's an object of politics, okay? So it's really what we call an hybrid object. And this is what uh, is so interested in this, uh, in, the, in this notion of criticism. So practically what it is, um, so this is a, a thin, uh, uh, this is a diagram of the thin pellicles that we are uh, talking of, of. So I think you're familiar with these uh, objects uh, because these objects are, are studying by dedicated disciplines and maybe you have some notion of atmospheric sciences, you have some notion of agronomy, you have some notion of uh, groundwater, which is most of our drinking water, you have the notion of hydrology, you have some notion of soil sciences or pedology. So you see that the critical zone is actually consists of considering this, this thin pellicle at the surface of the earth as a system, as a whole. I am not trying to distinguish the soil from the water, from the surface water, from the deep, deep water. I'm not trying to distinguish the ecosystem from the rest. So this notion of critical zone will try, and this is one of the main uh, advantages, I think, of this notion, not to distinguish living organisms and non-living organisms. In other words, another way, another way to put it is to say, well, if I give you like a clay, uh, a clay or a termite mount, is it something which is living? Is it something which is non-living? This is not a good way of posing the question. And the critical zone, by considering all these, these different compartments, uh, objects being connected each other, is, is the way we want to, to think about. So note that life is everywhere. And so what is interesting, and I will comment on that in a, in a minute, what is the difference between the notion of critical zone and the notion of ecosystem is a fundamental difference that uh, when you talk about ecosystem, and I know you've been people, colleagues of mine, which have been talking about biodiversity, etc. They probably have been talking about the bio biodiversity of the uh, ab above ground biomass. But actually, more and more, we discover that there exists a, a deep biomass, 
which is basically unknown. We don't even know the species which are uh, in, that, in the fractures here of the rocks. Very deep, they can go far, they can go deep. Uh, like 100 meters, we find water, we, we find uh, living organisms which are doing something. Huh? And so the, the, the critical zone concept is different from the ecosystem concept. It's not coming from the same scientific community. It's coming from the geosciences. The ecosystem concept is more coming from the biology community. But I would say that the critical zone um, concept is broader than the ecosystem concept, at least in the modern sense of the ecosystem world. So this is a vertical, this is a vertical um, representation of the critical zone, but the critical zone can also be considered laterally. So this is uh, a diagram, again, uh, which is showing you a, a catchment or watershed, as we call it in English, which is a, um, a drainage basin. So imagine it could be, for example, the Amazon. And on that diagram, you have the different uh, uh, laterally, uh, the objects which are composing the, the critical zone. You can have the glaciers here, you have a, a, a river, a head, head, head river here, you have floodplains here, which are very important. You have swamps or, or humid areas like peatlands, for example. And of course, below ground, you have a, a whole world containing water and living organism, which is there and which is playing a role. And everything here in, in that particular uh, diagram is, is uh, all the compartments are connected. So, as one of my colleagues from Berkeley used to say, and I like the expression, the critical zone is a think. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one think. Uh, it's a new view of a system which is composed of so-called familiar objects, but each of the objects that I have been talking about, like a river, can be deconstructed. And we can spend the whole afternoon thinking of what is a river. And there is a, a quite very good book uh, written by uh, Philippe Dacunia last uh, last year or a couple of years ago, which is the invention of rivers. Actually, the the term river river was invented by the English engineers when they came to India. And for example, in the Indian culture, there is no no river. There is a state of the water. There is a wetness a wetness a state of the water at the given time of the hydrological cycle. So we can, we can deconstruct all these so-called familiar objects, at least in our culture, and, and, and the critical zone is con considering them as a whole. So this is a typical diagram. I'm not going into the details here, but this is a typical diagram that you will find in a paper on the critical zone. So this is one of the PNAS uh, proceeding of the National Academy of Science in the U.S. by my colleagues Rimpy and Dietrich, that this is typically the type of representation. So you have the vegetation here, what we usually call the ecosystem. Uh, below you have the soil. The, the term soil is very dangerous and can be comprised by different people very differently. For, for a peasant, the soil is not the same notion than for uh, someone which is constructing buildings, etc. So below this thin, uh, very thin organic rich uh, uh, pellicle, which we call here the soil, you have a fractured, weathered. Weathered means that have been changed by chemical reactions, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. And then below you have some water, what we usually call the uh, aquifer, but the aquifer is not a lake with water. It's water which is uh, uh, occupying the pores between the grains of this zone, which is totally fractured because it has been weathered from this un unweathered bedrock, which is below, but still, which is very fractured. And, and actually, more and more, the scientists, when they drill very deep uh, cores into, the, into, into this zone here, they do find water, okay? I have been um, working on a project in the Vosges Mountains in the eastern part of France. So the Vosges Mountains is one of the typical uh, granitic mountains that we have in France. And we, we went at like 100 meters of elevation and we drilled. And it was very, very uh, impressive and interesting to see that, so you drilled, so you have hard rocks, this is granitic rocks, uh, and then and then everything stops and you have water. You have like a crumbled zone, which is totally crushed, 
porous, with water in it, with microorganism in it, and then you come back on granite for like 50 meters, and then you encounter a new zone in which water is circulating, etc., etc. So we're living, actually, we're living as humans, and all the living organisms, we're living of like a sponge. You know, everything below our feet is a sponge, with, with filled with water, filled with gases also, with, filled with life. Okay? But life that you don't see, life which is very difficult to, to study because it's, it's, it's hidden, it's, it's there, and it has been there for millions probably, at least thousands, maybe millions, why not billions of years. Um, okay, so you do see something which I'm going to, to spend some time on, which is that this, this zone is, is really, uh, is very thick, uh, thin, sorry, and don't ask me for numbers, it's thin. Okay, um, let's say below 100 meters below our feet, uh, we are in the hard rock, so we're not in the critical zone, and above us, let's say 1,000 meters, uh, and, be and in between, we are in the critical zone of the planet. Uh, this is a zone which is uh, fueled, so I'm going to spend some time on the energy, which is fueling this zone, because it's a, it's a zone which is highly dy dynamic, it's a zone where a lot of processes, a lot of cascade of, of chemical and physical reactions are occurring. This zone is fueled basically by two sources of energy. Uh, the energy from the sun, which is represented here. The energy from the sun in particular is uh, activating the water cycle at the surface of the Earth. I'm going to show you that. And there is another source of energy that shouldn't be uh, forgotten, which is the, the plate tectonic, the energy from the Earth interior, okay? Because if you have mountains, this is because you have a plate tectonic on the planet, okay? There are planets in the solar system, like the Moon, for example, where there is no plate tectonic. There is no energy from the deep Earth which is uh, being used <coughs> and being transformed into mechanical energy, okay? So the surface of the Moon is totally static. It's an inactive planet. The Earth, the advantage of this planet, of our planet, is that it is um, animated by a very large and broad uh, tectonic um, forces and movements that create, in particular, the mountains, that also create the volcanic, volcanic activity in some places. So the critical zone is at the frontier uh, between these two big sources of energy. And just to put some numbers on, on these two sources of energy, because this is really important to get these numbers in mind, the energy that the Earth is um, sp uh, spending uh, each year is 44 terawatt. So the watt is a, is a unit of work, joule per second, and, and the tera is 10 to the power 12. Okay, this is a huge number, this is which is quite normal, the Earth planet is big. 40, 44 terawatt is what the Earth is, uh, is the energy which is coming from the deep Earth. What, so what it is, it is essentially the radioactivity of the elements which are composing the Earth internally. Okay, so for example, uranium, thorium, potassium, they are radioactive, and as you know, radioactive transformation uh, uh, release energy and, 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 and eat. Okay, and this is, this is what is, this 40 terawatt is actioning the plate tectonic on a long, on a long scale. The energy we, we receive from the sun on a mean average, because of course that's going to change uh, depending on where you are on the planet and that's going to, to depend upon the season, but on, on average we receive 180,000 terawatt. So much, much more energy, okay? This is a big, big asymmetry between the uh, amount of energy that we receive from below and the energy that we receive at the surface of the Earth that we receive from, from above. But if you go like one meter below the surface where all these uh, bacteria, archaea bacteria are living, they don't see the sun energy or at least very indirectly. They see the deep Earth energy. And, and to compare with these two numbers, uh, the humans, you, I, uh, us, we are uh, consuming each year 15 terawatts, okay? A number which is close to the energy which is released by the internal Earth. So this is where the critical zone is. So this is two slides or a couple of slides to, s to wrap up what I've, 
what I've just told you, which is that the planet, this is a, a view of the uh, internal Earth. So basically there is a big uh, inter uh, uh, core, which is iron rich. I'm not going into the details here. And this zone here between the surface and the core is called the mantle. This is a strange world to call mantle something which is below, but uh, this is the way it is. And this mantle, uh, geophysicists and geologists have shown that this mantle is animated by very big, big, big movement of convection. So convection is a physical way of cooling uh, something. Uh, for example, when you put water uh, and you eat water, you eat, you eat a, a tank of water, you do see uh, the convection which is happening after a couple of minutes. And this is exactly what is, what is happening in the Earth. So here it's hot, here it's, it's cold relatively cold and the convection movements into the mantles are taking matter which is hot, uh, raising it up at the surface and then the matter is displaced horizontally etc. So it, it draws very large convection cells and because the surface of the planet is rigid and is not uh, uh, plastic, the mantle is plastic, so it can be deformed in a very uh, plastic way, but the surface that we call the crust is not plastic. And so the crust is like, uh, is behaving, is just trying to adapt to the motion of the internal earth. And so the surface, the earth surface is divided into a number of plates, what we call plates, and this is a big discovery of the plate tectonics back to the 1970s. Uh, there is about uh, 20 plates, so you can describe the surface of the Earth by about 20 plates, which are non-deformable uh, entities, okay? And these plates can move relatively to each, each to another, n another. They, can, they can diverge or they can converge. When they diverge, you have an ocean. When they converge, you have a mountain. Okay, this is basically the big discovery of plate tectonic. And this is a picture of the Himalaya, which is a big, big mountain range here, which is existing because the Indian plate, which uh, 50 million years ago was down here, um, uh, came uh, and collided the uh, big Eurasian plate, which is a big plate, very uh, immobile one, and the collision was very rapid and very energetic, and this gave birth to these uh, beautiful and very high mountains. Just to say you that the expression of the cooling of the Earth um, is convection and the plate tectonics. The second ingredient, as I told you, is solar energy. So the solar energy is warming the surface of the Earth, and you've all, of course, experience that by being in the sun in the middle of July, it's just impossible to stay because it's just too much energy which is coming to you. And this is just a picture that you you've probably have seen many times, but it's a nice picture uh, based on satellite data, which is giving us the mean temperature at the surface of the Earth. So it's very impressive that you have a big gradient between the equatorial latitudes and the northern uh, latitudes. Also, or southern latitude between plus uh, uh, 30 and minu minus 40 or 50 uh, degrees um, because the sun is warming essentially uh, the equatorial and intertropical regions of the earth. Okay, and so big differences. Uh, why the sun is not uh, warming these and these latitudes is because the, the, the ray of the of the radiation is to the angle that the radiation make with the surface of the Earth is too low, and there's no way you can uh, warm significantly the planet. It's exactly the same like here in winter or now in autumn. The, the sun is very low, and so you don't feel the same amount of energy which is um, coming to you than uh, in compare when you are in July. And so uh, these big, big uh, temperature differences. Uh, are just uh, an, an evidence that the, that the surface of the Earth is being uh, warmed by the sun energy. And of course, when you warm uh, water here, because most of the Earth's surface is water, then you will transform liquid water into vapor water. And so this is the beginning of the water cycle, which is something which is really important for my purpose today and which is specific to the planet Earth which is that some water which was originally here in the tropical or equatorial ocean 
is going to be uh, transferred into the, in, into the atmosphere. Because when you warm, when the, when the sun energy warms the ocean, some part of the water is transformed into a vapor phase. And because there is an atmospheric circulation that, I've, uh, that I have represented here, and I don't want to go into the details here, I probably, Hervé Le Trout, uh, had commented this uh, global circulation of atmospheric masses with much more details than I will do. Uh, when you have water, uh, of water which is wa war vapor, which is formed here in the tropical zone, sorry, here, it's going to be transferred into the northern latitude because you have a big, big um, global circulation of the atmosphere, again, which is animated by the solar energy, which is a way of, for the Earth to cool, to, to, to take the excess of energy which is occurring at the equator and to bring it, bring it to the poles. Okay, so the water cycle, and this is exactly the point where I want to go today, the, w the resulting of these two competitive uh, energy uh, fluxes, these two competitive forces, uh, so to say, is the water cycle, which is specific of our planet. You won't find another planet in the solar system which has a water cycle. Okay, this is really the unicity of the, of the planet, which is a kind of a miracle, by the way. My miracle, because there is water on Earth, I don't want to spend too much time on that here today, but this is a miracle. You don't have water on Mars. I mean, you, have, you had water on Mars, but we don't know where it is now. You don't have water on Venus. You, have, you don't have water on the Moon. You have water on Earth. So the water has kept its water in a way. So again, what is a water cycle? So this is the fact that the ocean is getting warmed by the solar energy, essentially at the equator. Some water is evaporated. Most of the water which is being evaporated by the ocean is precipitated in the form of rain on the ocean. Okay, and now we have the numbers. And the numbers is at 434, four, four, sorry, 434, um, 10 to the 10,000 cubic kilometer per year are being evaporated globally on the planet. But 300 and uh, like four, 400, let's say, uh, thousand uh, cubic kilometer per year are being reprecipitated on the ocean. So almost everything is being reprecipitated locally on the ocean. Basically, it's raining on the ocean. But some of this water is surviving, okay, and is then precipitated, transformed into rain, which is going to be deposited on the continents. Okay, you see that the, the amount of precipitation on the continents is 107. 107 is not what 434 minus 388. Uh, so there is an additional uh, flux of water which is coming to the atmosphere. And what it is, it's something that the scientists know pretty well, which is called evaporation. And more exactly, and I would, I, I should have corrected my slide, this is not really evaporation, this is evapotranspiration. And what is it? It's the fact that the trees, the vegetation, the above ground vegetation is taken water from the soil by the roots and is, uh, how to say, giving it back to the atmosphere. Essentially, a tree is like a pump of water, taking water into the soil and giving it back to the atmosphere. And this is a huge flux at the surface of the Earth. So suppress the forest, suppress the Amazonian, Amazonian forest, for example, you will suppress this extremely big term of the global cycle, cycle, water cycle. So suppress the forest, you will suppress the water cycle. This is why people, not like me, but like Bruno Latour, which is a philosopher, so he's not really interested in the details, is saying that if there is a, a global cycle at the surface of the Earth, this is because of life, yeah? because life has taken all the um, operation possible to maintain his, his, his survival by organizing the water cycle. Okay, so very important to understand this water cycle. The water cycle is not only a matter of solar energy, it is, of course, but it's also a matter of plate tectonic. Because why do we have terrestrial surfaces on the planet? 
you may not be, uh, uh, you may not have uh, done a lot of geology, but why we have continents on the planet is because these continents are made on a of a particular rock, which is a gra granite, basically, the, the family of granites. And these granites are, 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 have a relatively low density compared to the rocks which are below, which are the, the rocks of the mantle. And so they act like, uh, how to say, a balloon on, on, a, on, a, on a pool. If you try to take your balloon and put it into the water, then the, the, the balloon is, is tending to going up again. Okay? This is a, what we call the Archimede uh, uh, force, uh, or buoyancy in English. And so this is exactly the way it works for the continent. So the continent is relatively light matter, which is posed on something which is denser. And so it's floating, in a way, okay, at the surface of the planet. And in we, if we look at the way continents have been formed into the geological history, this is again due to plate tectonic. So if you want a planet with continents, in other, way, in other words, something which is not below the the ocean, but above the ocean, you need a plate tectonic. And in Earth's history, the continents have appeared two billion years ago when the plate tectonic started to play. Okay? So if you have a water cycle at the surface of the planet, this is not only a matter of solar energy which is distributed at the surface of the planet, this is also a matter of a long geological history which is activated by the, the cooling, the geological cooling of the planet, which is animating plate tectonics. Okay? I really want you to capture this idea, because usually the water cycle is something which is presented as being you know, due to the solar energy which is redistributed at the surface of the, of the Earth. No way. If you don't have continents, you don't have a water cycle. Okay, so uh, I uh, advise you, if you're interested by these uh, stories here, a very nice book by m one of my colleagues, which is Volk. Uh, I, I, I forgot to write down the title. The title is, is, um, is Gaia or something like that, the title. Yeah, Gaia by Volk, 1999. It's a very good book where it compares... Uh, the internal energy to Vulcan, which is, uh, you, you remember, this is a greed god of, uh, of, uh, inter of, of uh, uh, fire, and Helios, which is uh, the, the sun. Okay? And so he is saying that he's developing this in a quite uh, poetic argument that we are living at the border between Vulcan and Helios, and this is ev where everything on the planet has been made possible for life to develop. Okay, and so now we have sun, which is uh, <laughs> warming up the, the board <laughs> here. Uh, and pr pr uh, yeah, you, you have a hard time reading the, the slides. I'm sorry, I don't think it's possible to do anything. No, because this university is too poor. Okay, uh, so what is interesting, so this is a water cycle, okay? But the story doesn't end up there. When the water is circulating at the surface of these emerged continents, something is happening. There is a chemical reaction which is happening. And this reaction is something you may uh, absolutely well feel, which is the same reaction you have when you put, so, for example, some vinegar on a limestone, on a rock. This is an experiment you probably did when you were young, you know? at the school. You take vinegar or any kind of acid, you put it on a limestone. A limestone is a, the, the stones which uh, Paris are built with. Uh, and then and it, there's a reaction which is occurring. Okay? You are dissolving the rock. And more generally, any kind of acid is able to dissolve a rock. Any kind of rock. Any kind of acid. And this is exactly what is happening at the surface of the Earth. Why? Because in the atmosphere, at least initially on Earth, you had a lot of this uh, guy here, gas, CO2, okay? You are familiar with CO2, you are generation, you are CO2 generations. Uh, everything is talking about CO2 now. You, you buy a train ticket, you have the amount of CO2 that you are going to spend, and the number of trees you had to plant if you want to compensate for your trip. Okay, but CO2 was present in a very uh, important quantity uh, initially in, in the Earth's atmosphere. And CO2 has a great affinity for water. So when it rains, 
the CO2 is, dis is dissolved into the rain. And the rain is becoming acidic because CO2 is an acid, actually. And the, the, the name CO2, um, Lavoisier was one of the French chemists that worked a lot on the CO2. And at the time of Lavoisier, CO2 was not called carbon dioxide, but it was called carbonic acid. Acid. And acid is something which is aggressive. Okay? And so when CO2, oops. Là, je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé. Did I... Yeah, it's my fault. So when, when it's raining, the water crossing through the atmospheric columns is dissolving the CO2, which is present. Okay? And then you got something, which is, you have the chemical reaction here, if you're interested in. You have something, a solution which is acidic. You may have heard about the problem of acid rains which is a big problem, still a big problem in some parts of the world. So, some, some, so, for example, China. The acid rain issues was a real issue in Europe in the late uh, 90s. It's now becoming not an issue because we have been taking measures to remove the acidity from the, uh, from the coal, for example. Uh, but rain, by nature, are acidic. Okay? This is a natural process. Okay? And so when this rain, rain which is uh, um, precipitating at the surface of the earth, is meeting with the rock, then the rocks, then a reaction occurs. And so this reaction is transforming the minerals uh, which are uh, in the rock. Uh, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> There's nothing we can do. Huh? You, don't, you don't see anything here. It is really the zone which is important is here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, either we wait like one hour. <laughs> yes? What's your idea? Send the presentation. <laughs> this, is, this is a typical case of geoengineering. <laughs> No, come on, you're not going to... Ah, no, 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 you need to go there. <laughs> no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going, I'm going to do it an old, in an old-fashioned way. With this and, and the blackboard. Uh, this is an interesting part of the, of the talk because you, you, when the rain is going to uh, come at the surface of the earth, that's going to infiltrate, and you will have a reaction zone here where the water which is uh, loaded with CO2, so which is acidic, and by acidic I mean pH of 3, for example, which is quite low, which is a pH of a, a, a bad Beaujolais and Coca-Cola, uh, and and th this solution here is going to interact here with the rock, okay? So these small crosses denote the rocks, okay? And that's going to make a, a reaction. Uh, I don't want to bother you with uh, chemical reactions, but if some of you are interested, this is one of the reactions that the scientists have been describing. So this is typically a silicate, a calcium silicate, the earth, the crust of the earth is mostly made of calcium silicate plus the uh, protons, the acidity, the H plus, plus, wa plus water, of course. And that's leading to uh, two different, very different behaviors depending on the chemical elements. Some chemical elements are soluble. And what does it mean, soluble? Soluble means that they have a great affinity for water. This is the way they are. I mean, it's, it's, it's coming from the periodic table, the chemical properties. Uh, and for example, calcium is a soluble element. Potassium, magnesium, sodium, the, the element that you see on the mineral water bottle that you, that you drink, okay? Which are good for your body because they are nutrients for you. Huh? And so these elements are going to leave, okay? Because they leach out by the acidity of the rain. Okay, this is basically the reaction which is occurring. And 
What is very important is to see that the aluminum, which was a, a component of the crust, is not going to move. Because aluminum, it's the way it is, aluminum doesn't like water. It's not soluble. It's insoluble. Okay? So what aluminum is going to do is going to combine with the other elements and form a new mineral. So the reaction of the acid rain with the rock is forming elements which are going to leave. Okay? So you're losing mass. And this is really my point today. You're losing mass. Mass is going out of the system. Plus, you form new minerals. And what are these new minerals? Uh, maybe you have recognized the chemical formula here. It's a clay. Okay? And so it's in the Bible, huh? uh, the clay. Uh, the, the product of the reaction between the acid rate, rain and the rock is clay, to form clays. So this thin pellicle at the surface of the Earth, which is the, re the reaction zone between the acidity of the atmosphere and the rocks, is going to be a clay-rich layer. And it's going to be porous because some mass has been leaving. Okay? And this was my uh, very bad here drawing, which is you have these uh, grains here, which are the clays, which have been neoformed into the zone here. And in between, you have pores. Okay? It's void. It's empty. Okay? And in that pores, what could you put? You can put water. You can put gas. Eventually, you can put living organisms, okay? And this is where life, actually, on the planet developed. Life only was able to develop, the space of life, was the space made possible by this reaction between the CO2 and the rocks, which is, which is creating porosity. It's a little bit more complicated, more subtle, I would say, because I told you that CO2 was dissolving in the water, but actually, actually, if you take the amount of CO2 which is present in the atmosphere, like today, 4,000 ppm V, p ppm per volume, per part per million, part per volume, you get something, you get a solution, a rain which is acidic, but not that much. And there is on Earth something which is increasing the acidity of the water to make the water even more aggressive. And what it is, this is the action of living organisms here. This is the coupling, the coupling between photosynthesis and respiration. So I don't want to go into these details today, but this is probably something you know. Photosynthesis is a chemical reaction, which is probably the most uh, wonderful chemical reaction on Earth. It was invented two billion years ago but by some very small uh, organism called cyan cyanobacteria. They invented a way of capturing the solar energy to transform the solar energy into chemical energy, something humans don't, don't, don't know how to do. Huh? We, are, we have solar panels, but we are very bad with capturing the solar energy, and that is probably something that we need to develop if we want to survive on the planet. But this was invented by some bacteria, an archaeobacteria, uh, a long time ago, and this is photosynthesis. But of course, these bacteria are taking up CO2 from the atmosphere, but one day we will, they will die. And some of our organisms are uh, using the organic matter that they have been producing to live. This is exactly what you're doing when you eat a vegetable or, or a french fries or any, any kind of meat, if you still eat meat. Um, then you respire and you remove, you release the CO2 in the atmosphere again. And what happens just here, right at the surface of the, of the critical zone, right at the surface of the Earth, is a thin layer which is really enriched in CO2 because this is where the organic matter is being decomposed. The organic matter that have been photosynthesized is being decomposed. This is a good season to go and uh, harvest mushrooms and the mushrooms are growing here in that particular very thin layer which is organic and the mushrooms are typically the organisms which are decomposing the organic matter which has been, which has been photosynthesized. So this is in a way, so I'm taking a little bit of time to explain that because it's a, how to say, an accelerator, okay? More CO2 is going to be produced extremely locally, okay? And that will acidify the pH. So again, you meet something which is really important for today's talk, which is the fact that everything is driving, driving, dri driven by life. Okay? The life organisms 
these organisms here, and the coupling between photosynthesis and respiration is a way to lower the acidity of the incoming solutions. And so what, what you do if you increase the acidity, then you increase the transformation of the rock into, into something soft, which is your, where you live, you know? And, and again, this is a way of life that life is using to maintain his, 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 his way of living, okay? His, his, uh, his habitat, okay? So this is really into, I'm, I'm going to mention this theory uh, at, the, at the end of the talk, but this is really the Gaia theory, which is telling us that life on the planet is organizing the conditions for its survival, okay? And this is a typical Gaian, let's say, uh, so to say, example. So life is everywhere, because this is a porous medium here, and you can put bugs here, you can put life, you can put roots here. So this is a picture I have taken in La Réunion Island, for example, where you do see these roots which are penetrating very deep, and eventually the roots are going to penetrate and go very deep. We know very little about the, the penetration depth of roots, actually. Farmers know that roots are able to go very, very deep. Uh, they are going to look for the nutrients. And if there is no nutrient in the soil, then the plant is trying to go deeper and deeper to reach the layer, eventually, or the rocks, where she can capture, scavenge the nutrients. And this is a picture, unfortunately the light is horrible, but this is a really interesting picture that was given to me by one of my geophysicist colleagues, which is, it's really, really fascinating, it's bacteria. So these, bu these bugs here are bacteria. But if you see here, there are Ys here. And these Ys are connecting the bacteria. It's like, it's, it's like have you seen the film, uh, the movie uh, Avatar? It's exactly this idea. <laughs> so all these bugs which are present in the soil or in the critical zone are being connected. From an electrical point of view, it's exactly like, like you have, you know, the connection between my computer and, and this uh, device here. It's a circulation of electron. So these bacteria have invented a way to communicate with each other. So when something is happening at the surface of the critical zone, eventually the bacteria which are like 10 meters deep are going to be aware of what is happening at the top and will be able to react in a, in a, in a good way to maintain again the conditions. So a couple, maybe a couple of pictures and I brought some rocks because I'm a geologist so I like rocks. And so uh, they're not very um, impressive. I had one in my office which is much more impressive, but it was too heavy. So I took the small ships, okay? So you see it's, uh, it's rocks, okay? Uh, taken from the Caribbean island. Why the Caribbean island? Because it's a tropical climate and everything is more active into tropical climates. And so you see the, the rock here, the fresh rock, and you see the weathered pellicule around which is exactly the transformation by the water coming from the rain, the acidic ra water, the transformation of rock into something which is, you will see, porous, okay? Dirty, this is dirt, okay? But this is where we live, huh? And this is a transformation, so if you want, you can uh, look at them. So this is a picture, so this is the, oh, nothing, you can see nothing, I'm really sorry about that. Uh, yeah, this is the rock, which is in my office, and I wanted to bring it to today, but it was too heavy. So uh, in terms of density, because the density, is, what is the density? is the weight, okay, per, per, per unit of volume. So the density here of the rock that you have in hands here is 2.7 means 2.7 gram per uh, cubic centimeter. So you take one cube of centimeter, one centimeter. Uh, it is, is mass is going to be 2.7 grams. If you make this, the density measurement into the weathered pellicle here, okay, the, the, this pellicle which has been transformed uh, here, um, then the density is two. Why is it lower? Because some of the elements have been uh, have been uh, leached out, okay? They've, they've left the system. And where are they? They have gone to the, to the river. They have gone to the rivers, to the water, and they are going to the ocean, finally. 
And so this is a picture of the, well, it's obviously useless to show these pictures because that's really, really horrible. No, you see, you see a little bit. Yeah, so it's a quarry where uh, these rocks here come from. So we are in the northern part of the Caribbean island in Guadeloupe, which is a French uh, island. And you do see, really, you do see the critical zone here. You see the forest. So be careful. In my, in my sense of the critical zone, the forest is not separated from the critical zone. The forest is in the critical zone, OK? Exactly like the clays are in the critical zone, OK? This is, a, this is some transformation of the initial rock by the rainwater, OK? Uh, and so you see the forest. You see the thin pellicle here, which is the arable soil, because soil doesn't mean anything. My advice to you is to stop using this term, this stupid term soil, which in French is even stupid because soil means, I'm, for example, I'm walking on the soil here in French. You see, uh, je marche sur le sol, I'm walking on the soil, <laughs> which is exactly the same notion than the soil I'm talking about, which is below and from which I'm, I'm growing my food. This is, strange, uh, this is a strange thing. Huh? So this is the arable soil, a soil that you can grow, in which you can grow your, your food. And, but below this arable soil, soil, if we were to go to this quarry here, you would see like 50 meters of, of something which is not the arable soil, which is not the rock, but which is soft material, which is exactly the, the brown stuff that you've been looking at on your, on your rocks here. OK? So this is what the geologists, but forgive, forgive them, to use this horrible term called saprolite. I don't want you to, to, <laughs> to know this term. It's a totally uh, jargon term. But I would call it the geological soil. Okay? This is not a soil in the agronomical point of view. You cannot grow, grow something from that soil. But this is, this is not rock. Okay? So this is coming from the transformation of the rain, which is coming from above, and the rocks. And in that quarry, um, uh, if you go 50 meters deeper, you can touch the rock, the rock that you have been touching here by looking at the rocks uh, right now. Okay, so this is uh, in, the, in tropical climates, uh, the critical zone is quite uh, developed. Uh, of course, if you go to Corsica, which is, uh, or if you in any other mountains or place where there is no enough water or where the temperature is too low, you will see this. Uh, it, you, you, you don't see anything, actually. You see rocks here. But uh, maybe if you're lucky, you can see that there are some trees here. You, do you see the trees? <laughs> For example, there is a tree uh, up there, here, here. So it's an impressive landscape because when you, when you hike in that landscape, you are uh, walking on rocks, but at some times you have beautiful trees, like that big, okay? So they are uh, nourished from the critical zone, which is below you. You don't see it. It's not a very well-characterized soil, like I described in the Western Indies. But they are taking up the water from deep fractures going into the rocks, and where the chemical uh, reactions that I've been talking about are occurring. Because remember, and I will show you that in a minute, these chemical reactions, which are, which are transforming the rock minerals into something else, is the way for, the li for life, for ecosystem, to get the nutrients. There is no other way you can get new nutrients. The phosphorus that you have been uh, consuming uh, for your lunch is coming from rocks. Okay? And it has been brought to you by chemical weathering reactions, the kind of reactions I'm, I'm mentioning here. So some of our pictures, uh, yeah, we don't see anything. So this is a, a diagram which is uh, summarizing, in a way, what I've, I, have, I am trying to show, which is, so you have, you have a, a, a critical zone profile, so that's just a vertical profile where at the base you have the rocks. The rocks are introduced into the critical zone, which, is, which you can consider as a reactor, okay? By a tectonic uplift. What does it mean, uplift? This is the fact that when you have a mountain, like the Alps or the Himalaya, 
the tectonic forces make the mountains rise. Okay? So everywhere at the surface of the Earth, where you, are, where you have a relief, when you look in details at the, at the way the Earth crust is moving, you have uplift. Okay? Rock, rock are uplifted due to tectonic forces. So tectonic is uplifting the minerals into the, into the zone where you have these reactions of water, gas, which is CO2, and which is transforming the rock into something which is soft, uh, the things that you are looking uh, at now, uh, by a reaction. So I don't, uh, really, I, I don't think I really gave you the name, but the, 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 these reactions uh, uh, have a generic term that we call uh, weathering, chemical weathering. Weather uh, means to be altered, altered, okay? Um, I remember the first time when I met uh, the philosopher Bruno Latour, and I, I showed you my rocks here, and, it, and he told me, oh yeah, you has a, how did he say, you has a third of the geochemistry. You're looking at the things which are being altered, okay? You're looking at the things being, you know, transformed, altered. So this is exactly the metaphor that we can use. So what happens now, uh, once you have formed this uh, critical zone material here, which can be living or non-living, can be clay, but it can also be these trees here, uh, the material is lost uh, from this reactor. In other words, the reactor keeps a constant volume. You're not continuously adding material to the reactor without losing material. So you're losing material from your reactor in two ways. Either uh, you lose uh, material into a dissolved form, okay, so all these elements that I've told to you about before, which are calcium, sodium, potassium, which are soluble elements, they will move with water, okay, they will be transported by the water, because the water is continuously flowing through the critical zone, through the reactor. And then you will also lose material by we call that physical erosion. So the first term was chemical erosion, and the second is physical erosion, which is that just the fact that in some places, in most of the places, you cannot uh, make more and more, more and more critical zone this soft material at the surface of the Earth. At what point is going to, it, it is going to be destabilized? Because it's sliding, because there is a slope, because there is a storm, because there is a hurricane, etc., etc. Okay. And so this is the two, uh, uh, how to say, way of forming and destroying uh, the critical zone. And you can imagine that in some way, in, at some point, there is a steady state between what is forming new cri critical zone and what is destroying uh, the critical zone. So this is a picture of uh, <laughs> a stream <laughs> in uh, South Asia I have been working on which is supposed to be very brown, and the brown color of the stream is due to the fact that it's trans transporting a lot of clays. These clays here, which has been formed by the chemical reaction, transforming rocks into uh, soft material of the critical zone. So why uh, the critical zone is so important for the scientist? So for the scientist, a critical means a critical layer of the, of the planet, of the system planet. Okay? So it's a zone that uh, needs to be studied, okay? because it's critical for the planet. Of course, the political sense is absolutely different. Okay? And I will finish by that today. Poli critical means you have to take care of. Okay? This is the only place you can live on, on that planet. So be careful. You have to care about it. But for the scientists, like I am, this is a, a critical interface. There are many interfaces on the planet. Uh, for example, the ozone layer is one of these interfaces. Without ozone layer, we're not able to live. Okay? And without this critical zone, we, the planet is not able to, to, to be maintained. So at least for four reasons here, the critical zone is important. It's important because it's regulating climate at a long, long uh, period of time. I will show you a slide in a minute. Because as you guess, uh, the, the acidity of the rain is, is, is produced by the dissolution of the CO2. Uh, but you know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So if you have more weathering, more transformation of rock into critical zone, then you will consume the CO2 of the atmosphere. 
then you will cool the earth. So the formation of the critical zone, these cr chemical weathering reactions, are regulating on the long term the climate of the planet. Uh, but it's also important for water quality, because as you, as you understood, the uh, composition of the water is directly, the drinking water, is directly uh, 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 inherited from these chemical reactions which are happening here at the base of the critical zone when the rocks are being transformed. It's also important for the ecosystems, and, and I want to insist on that. All the nutrients that you are uh, consuming when you eat something, when you eat your food, are coming from the rocks, okay? There is one or uh, two exceptions. But all of the other elements that you need, you need calcium because you need calcium for your bones. Where does the calcium come from? It comes from minerals which were here, which has been transformed into something else by these chemical weathering, weathering reactions, okay? Uh, the worst element is phosphorus. Okay? And the phosphorus is a, an element which is limiting the growth of plants and animals in general. Phosphorus, unfortunately for us, is very rare in the rocks. Okay? In, we know one or two minerals which are containing phosphorus, which is a mineral called apatite. And I'm always surprised that nobody talks about apatite. Apatite, apatite is the mineral on which we, as humans, we rely on. Okay? Some, the, more, the more pessimistic of the scientists think that we still have 100 or 200 years of, of phosphorus, but that we will run out phosphorus very soon because we don't pay attention to recycle the phosphorus. So you consume phosphorus. Essentially, the phosphorus that you consume comes from Morocco. Morocco is the main source of phosphorus on Earth. This is where the big mines of phosphorus are. Okay? But what happens to your phosphorus? once you have consumed it. It goes straight to the wastewater. And what does happen, what does happen to the phosphorus when it goes to the waste, uh, wastewater? It goes into the ocean. The, waste, the treatment of the water in the, in the waste uh, treatment plants is not, is not changing the phosphorus, is not retaining the phosphorus. So we are in a really stupid situation and we will be judged by the future generation for that, that we're totally wasting the phosphorus. Right? It's going into the ocean. It's not lost, of course, but it's diluted. Yes? Do we use phosphorus for? Phosphorus is an absolutely necessary nutrient for growth. So we use uh, this, like the mines in Morocco, we mine the phosphorus using like fertilizers. Fertilizers, okay. So you, can know, you cannot grow like wheat, rice, or whatever without adding phosphorus to the system. In nature, or in natural conditions, the phosphorus is being con continuously recycled. For example, in the Amazon forest, once a leaf falls on the ground, the bacteria and the mushrooms are decomposing the leaf and the phosphorus is going back into the plant. There is a very efficient system of recycling. We are not smart enough to recycle the phosphorus. So we take phosphorus, we grow, we grow our crops, wheat, rice, etc. We consume it, or the cows consume it, etc. And then we let it go to the ocean where it's going to be diluted. We're losing it. This is why I say we are really stupid, really. And we will pay a very, ex very expensive price for that in the future. Not we, but our, uh, our, our grand, 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 grandchildren if there exist. Okay? Now, this is a, I'm, I'm, I, I want to say that because that's really a, a, a stupid situation in which we are. And so chemical weathering, this is a point, is providing the phosphorus. And then uh, uh, an importance of the critical zone is that it's shaping the relief which is uh, surrounding us because the, the dynamic of this very thick zone is controlling the erosion processes, the way the rivers are incising into the mountains, the glaciers, etc. So really, the reactions that are happening in the critical zone are really important for, for us. Uh, okay, I will pass on that, I will pass on that, I will pass on that. And one of the reasons why um, the surface of the moon, which is here, <laughs> is very different from the surface of the Earth, uh, is that the, the Earth has a critical zone. 
what I want to say here, uh, I want to mean, I mean, is that if you look at the surface of the moon, you see a number of craters. What are these craters? These craters are the impacts made by the, uh, the shock with meteorites and asteroids. Okay, and it occurred during all the long history of the moon. But, and, and, and these impactors probably eat the, the Earth too. There's no reason why the moon was shocked by meteorites and asteroids and not the Earth, because they're very close one to each other. But you see that at the surface of the Earth, even on the continents here, you don't see these impacts. And the reason is that there is a critical zone at the surface of the Earth, which is and continuously uh, rejuvenating the surface, okay? It's like your skin. When you, when you cut your skin, like one week or two weeks after, there is nothing left, okay? It's repaired. So there is a repairing mechanism on Earth, uh, which is a critical zone, which is uh, making that, uh, you know, the surface of the Earth is uh, entirely cleaned, cleaned up very rapidly. And uh, I want to quote this uh, 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 sentence from, from uh, one of the father of geology, James Hutton, he was a Scottish guy. We said, it's very famous, we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect for an end. It was the definition for him of the earth. No vestige of a beginning. Everything has been eroded, disappeared because of this critical zone functioning and no prospect for an end because we don't know what is going to, to happen. Okay? You can interrupt me if you have questions, of course. Um, okay. I think I need to speed up a little bit, so I'm going to pass on that. So what is so difficult from a scientific point of view to uh, study the critical zone? So as you say, as you saw, it's a complex environment. Uh, if I want to study it uh, from a holistic point of view, from a, from a systemic point of view, it's difficult. Okay? And this is the reason why uh, in the history the disciplines have been separated to look at one compartment apart. Uh, people are looking at the water, people are looking at the minerals, people are looking at the gases, people are looking at the ecology, etc. But this is not a way of getting a, a holistic view of the system. There is a problem of kinetics. So it's an important problem uh, because in the critical zone, you have reactions, transformations, which are occurring, some of them being very rapid, like a bacteria which is dividing, it takes like one second, okay? And some, of the, some others which are very slow. For uh, the rock here that you have been uh, uh, touching to be transformed, it takes 10,000 years, okay? So it's very slow. So you both have, if you want to model this zone from a scientific, you want to make a numerical model very practic practically, okay? You need to incorporate mechanisms which are very, very different time scale. And that, make, that makes a big, big um, a difficulty uh, in that, uh, in that uh, problem. Of course, the critical zone is very, very heterogeneous. And this heterogeneity is imposed by the, by the geology, by the relief. A shape, which, a, a slope which is north-shaped is not a slope which is south-shaped. It's different, okay? The vegetation is not going to be the same. The, the, the type of plants, the type of animals, the type of chemical reactions are not going to be the same. So we are in a very, very uh, complicated problem where we need to take into account the, the very uh, small differences in topography, in the type of geology, in the type of fracturation, in the climate, but the local climate. I'm not talking about the global, global clim climate, I'm talking about the local climate. And if you are, uh, for example, living in mountains, you know that, or in the Western uh, Andes, for example, you know that precipitation might be very, very different from one uh, place uh, of a hill uh, to the other, okay? Because you have local patterns which are affecting the distribution of vegetation, the distribution of temperature, the di distribution of vegetation. So the critical zone is highly heterogeneous, okay? It makes it, it, makes it very fascinating, but it makes it very complicated to, uh, to, uh, to study. And this is why, uh, if you look at the disciplines which are interested by the critical zone, 
there is a bunch of very different disciplines. And I'm going to go straight to that because this is probably one of the main uh, advantage, let's say, of the critical zone. So this is a diagram showing, the, showing you the, the critical zone. This is exactly the representation I have been using for like uh, the last hour. And you do see that I have added here the disciplines which are interested and might be interested at studying the critical zone. Of, of course, you have ecology because most of the critical zone is covered by the so-called ecosystem. So you have ecologists here working there, looking, for example, at the exchange of CO2 between the Amazonian forest and the atmosphere. This is very important for, in terms of global change, etc. You have microbiologists which, which are looking at the bugs in the soil. There are very few. Very small community compared to the ecologists, but there are a couple of people which are looking at what is happening into the soil. Uh, at the surface of the soil here, the, 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 the living organisms which are there. You have, of course, a very uh, old-fashioned and well-established science, which is pedology, or in English, soil science. Uh, you can be graduated in soil science if you want. Uh, they're more and more ra rare, the people that are graduated in, in soil sciences, but they still exist. And they have a very specific language. Uh, I happen to uh, take a, a class in pedology in my life. This is the only uh, class I have quitted. It was horrible. It was only names, you know. They're spending their time putting names on the, on, on the type of soil. And the type of soil is different. There are hundred or thousand types of soil, but it's purely descriptive. There's no idea of how it works, you know, and how it is connected with the ecology and how it's connected with the precipitation, with the meteorology, etc. But of course, uh, the study of the critical zone also uh, interests uh, geophysicists, which are looking at uh, the uh, deep structure of the critical zone. It interests, of course, geochemists or biogeochemists like me, geologists, uh, geomorphologists. Geomorphologists are the people looking at the relief, uh, trying to understand how the relief is, is formed. Hydrologist is a very important uh, uh, consor consortium in that, uh, in that respect because hydrology is the science which is providing to the founders and to the uh, policy makers uh, the amount of water that, that is available for, 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 for cities, for drinking uh, water. And of course, meteorology and so climatology and the climate people here. There is a big, big, uh, how to say, um, fracture uh, among the people looking at the critical zone, be be between the people that are coming from the geosciences and the people which are coming from bio biosciences. And this is a very deep fracture. And if you look at, and you try to analyze this, this fracture, where does it come from? It comes from the middle of the 18th century. At one point, geosciences have been separated from, from biosciences. Bio and this is one of the big issues we have. And you, maybe you know that if you are a geologist, or if, you, if you want to go to uni university and do geology, you won't have even a class in ecology. And the reverse, if you're an ecology, you won't have even one class of geology. There's no way. By the way, when you are a geologist, you don't like ecology. And when you're an ecologist, you don't like geology. You don't want to take it. Okay? So this is a big fracture. And now the Anthropocene issues uh, call us for reconnecting uh, this science, which has been separated for, for too many, too many uh, years. So the critical zone science, and this is really important to understand that, is a, is a new holistic view, okay? Uh, not dividing the object that we want to study into thousand, you know, compartments, reservoirs, and studying them apart, but looking at the systemic behavior of the system. This is really what we need to understand how the processes at the surface of the Earth are working. It's very important for uh, even very practical reasons like food production. Huh? Uh, so this notion uh, comes from the geological community. This is very important to realize that because it's different from the notion of ecosystem. And my next slide will explain it to you. Very important. Critical zone is all but global. Okay? Your generation, you have been, how to say, 
nourished by the cl climate model, the climate change, etc. Critical zone is not global. There is not one critical zone. There, there will be plenty of critical zones depending on where you are. If you are in the mountains, if you are in the plain, if it's saturated in water, if it's a swamp, if it's a dry area, uh, whether it's a river or etc. Okay? The critical zone takes into account the diversity of the life habitats, in a way. So, from a human point of view, and this is where politics enters into the game, it's not a globalization, it's a relocalization. Okay? This notion of critical zone. The critical zone concept introduces a vertical dimension, I think I showed you, and a temporal uh, dimension because this is studied by geologists, this is coming from the geological community and geologists we use to consider a very long time scale. For example, the, the, the time it takes for this very thin uh, gray brownish pellicle that you have been looking at here on the rock takes 10,000 years, okay? Which, you know, for policy makers is infinite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's infinite. You imagine what a country, a state like France will be in 10,000 years? No, it won't exist for sure. Okay, but from a geological point of view, it's just not even a second, okay? So this is a point where we are uh, trying to understand, to connect these time scales. So critical zone and ecosystems are closed, but they're different. And uh, the notion of ecosystem was introduced by a guy, Tensley, in 1935. And he defined the ecosystem as the sum of the biotope and the biocenos, the biotope being the living organism and the biocenos being the non-living organism. So ecosystem notion has introduced the distinction between living and non-living. And what I'm trying to tell you from uh, during the last hour was no, don't distinguish the living and the non-living. They're all part of a system and they interact with each other. Okay? For example, a clay. Can you tell me if a clay is living or non-living? It was produced by living organisms. So if you, if you suppress the bacteria, the microbes, which are doing the, these chemical reactions here, which are producing the CO2, which is enable uh, the reaction to occur, then you have nothing. So in a way, a clay, I'm, I'm slightly provocative here, of course, but a clay is a living organism. The rock that you've been in your, uh, passing, uh, passing through your hands is a living organism, to my uh, vision. And we are very close to two important people I, I'd like to mention, which is Vernatsky, who was a Russian guy. We wrote a book that you may uh, like to read. It's a wonderful book. It was written, written in French because he was spending his time in Paris. It was just during the Bolshevik Revolution. La Biosphere, the Biosphere, it has been translated in English. It's a really wonderful book. Very modern view of what we now call the Biosphere, which for Vernetsky was absolutely not the definition that we give today of the, to the Biosphere. Today, the Biosphere, is the, uh, uh, all the living organism on Earth. It's what the Earth scientists that build the Earth science model say. But for Vernadsky, the biosphere was not the, the sum of the whole living organism. For Vernadsky, the biosphere is a thin pellicle of the Earth, which is transformed by the solar energy. Wonderful, wonderful definition. And I think this is a true definition. This is a definition we should have in mind that we are living on a, on a thin pellicle at the surface, which is a transformation zone of the planet by the solar energy. And then we should mention Gaia. Gaia was a, a, a series of books. It's a theory which was uh, proposed by uh, James Lovelock, an English guy, still alive, 102 years. Uh, and Lynn Margulis, uh, which unfortunately um, uh, uh, is, is dead. Uh, and, and, and the Gaia uh, hypothesis is to say that living things on Earth are part of a planetary scale self-regulating system that has maintained habitable condition for the past 3.5 billion years. Gaia has very strong political implications because we are living organisms. And so we should be able, if we are smart enough, to do exactly what the plants have done, what the bacteria have done, 
we are changing the planet, but we should be able to maintain our habitable conditions on the long term. Okay? The implication, the political implication of Gaia is huge, and if you're interested, you can uh, uh, read this paper of my friend uh, Lenton and Latour in Science in 2018, which is, um, uh, uh, how to say, uh, proposing that the human, human beings, the humanity, should engage into what they call a Gaia 2.0, kind of a new version of Gaia where man uh, or humankinds become aware of what he's doing to the system and tries to make the system evolve towards a, a sustainable uh, state. Okay, and so how do scientists get organized to develop a critical zone science? Uh, this is my everyday life. I don't want to bother you too much with that, but I am responsible for a national network of observatories, which are places where the different disciplines are being connected to study the, the thing. Okay? Uh, and so this is a way the scientists, we are getting organized. So we are developing what we call critical zone observatories. So this notion of observatories is really important. This is, again, instrumented places with sensors, very simply. Okay? You choose a place for its representativity for, because it's, it's posing a, a, an, overall, an overarching question and you instrument it in a way uh, that you want to understand what happens from a, a physical, chemical, hydrological, ecological point of view. And these places are places where all the scientific communities meet. I showed you before the multiplicity, the, the, the diversity, we could say, of the scientists, the type of different scientists which are interested by the critical zone. There are too many communities. They don't speak the same language. If you, for example, it's an interesting experiment to do. You put a geologist and you put an ecologist into the same room. They don't understand each other. They've been separated for too many, many years, too many, I'd say, centuries. They don't understand each other. When one is talking about billion years, the other is talking about, you know, the week. Uh, uh, they're talking about the same thing, okay? They're talking about the critical zone, but they're not using the same words. So, places where all the disciplines are getting connected, first. And, and on that places that are choosing for their representativeness, we can look at energy, matter, budgets, uh, for example, at the water watershed scale. Monitoring, so this is very important, is done over a long period of time. Okay? There's no way you can understand the critical zone if you just monitor it like for two years. You need at least 10 years because it's a thing which has many nested temporalities. Okay? The season, the day, the season, the year, the 10 years, if not the 100 years. Okay? And of course, Policy makers are only interested by the free coming years. But this is not the way the Earth is working. Okay? Our habitat is uh, driven by temporalities which are very diverse and eventually very long. And there's no way we can skip that. This is the way it is. We are limited, not by the planetary boundaries, but we are limited by the, by the velocity, by the rate at which the processes which are generating our habitats are working. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, uh, sites. Uh, all these sites are anchored on an initial overarching uh, and local question. Um, the spatial scale can differ. You can imagine that you, stay, you study something which is big like that room, but you can also imagine that you study the Amazon basin, that you think is the Amazon basin, but you study it you study it in a holistic way, okay? You're not looking at the details and trying to separate uh, the, the type of trees and the types of uh, rivers. You're trying to uh, 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 look it as a whole. The idea is to use nature as a, a laboratory, okay? So this is something which is from the epistem epistemological point of view is important. So you're not doing experiment in the labs, okay? You don't trust that because you don't have the, all the temporalities in your lab. You go, into the la you, you go into the field, you go into nature, and you use nature as a natural uh, laboratory, uh, and you explore gradients. I have a slide showing you that in a minute. 
And the first network was funded in the US uh, 10 years ago. I'm going to show you what it is. So this is uh, to uh, uh, exemplify this idea of using nature as a laboratory. So this is, uh, you don't see what it is about, but uh, it's um, each cube here is a, is a site, is a place where scientists are going and are instrumenting. And eventually you can say, okay, I will fix the type of rock, so I will, I will look, for example, of, at uh, granitic catchments or basaltic catchments, in, in, other, in other way, places which, where the rock, the bedrock is a basalt, a volcanic lava, and I will try to look at different climates, okay? Or I can change the slope, or I can change human occupation. I can go and, and look at the catchment which is basaltic, forested, natural forest, and the same catchment cultivated. And I can instrument both places the same way. And I can try to understand what are the differences, what are, how the mechanisms are changed, the processes are, are changes because of human occupation. Okay? I, by changing, for example, the climate, I can look at the effect of climate. So this is what we call a space for time substitution, which is a way we instrument uh, nature, okay? And so in the US, the first network was funded uh, in 2000, uh, between 2008 and 2018, and, and yeah, uh, uh, 16, sorry, by uh, the NSF, which is the National Science Foundation. So this is where it started. So this is, this is here, you have the US here, and this is the, uh, the different catchments. So instrumented place, which are preferentially catchments, drainage areas, which have been instrumented. Okay, so I'm not going to comment that. And so uh, I'm, uh, the reason I'm interested in that is that I'm leading uh, the French, the equivalent French network of instrumented sites. So I don't want again to go into the details here. You have a web page you can go and, and look at if you're interested. So we in France, we, are, uh, we have put all the observatories, long-term observatories, and this country is very rich in observatories which have been monitoring for very, very long period of time uh, places of the, of the critical zone. For example, there is not far from here in Paris, an, uh, uh, like 50 kilometers far from Paris, uh, an observatory, which is an hydrological observatory, which is a place where hydrologists have instrumented and which has been running for 50 years. It's very rare to have time series of 50 years. But still, 50 years is nothing, okay? It doesn't allow you to make a politics, you know? It's not long enough, but it's the way it is. Huh? Because, you know, monitoring is expensive. Monitoring is something you have to, f you have to fight to get the money to make monitoring when you are a scientist. Because when you go to your favorite founder and you, you tell your founder, I need money for the next 50 years, <laughs> then it, it, it turned uh, and, and go back eh? and go away, sorry. Okay, uh, it's very difficult to get this funding and a number of countries in the world and especially the US where it's very difficult to make uh, recurrent uh, research uh, have a hard time funding their observatories. We're lucky in Europe, we're lucky in France to get this um, etatic system which is allowing us to get not a lot of money but sufficient money to maintain this observatory over the long term. This is really important. There is no way you can make an earth politics if you don't monitor the, the system. It's like if you want to, I don't know, you, 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 you heal you go to the hospital and no one is inspecting you. So you are in your bed, you heal, the doctors are not looking at you and they're making decisions. No, there's no way they can make decisions if, if they don't you know, measure your uh, blood pulsation, your, your uh, blood pressure, etc. This is the way we scientists, we're trying to work to convince our funders that we need to monitor the earth and we need to do it now and over long time scale if we want to make these decisions. So let me take like one or two examples. So one is in Africa. Africa is, so this is, these examples are, are, are one of the sites belonging to the French 
a, a network of critical zone observatories. So I didn't tell you that this uh, network is called uh, OSCAR. The R is missing here. OSCAR means uh, Observatoire de la Zone Critique Application et Recherche, Critical Zone Observatories, Applications and Research, and they are uh, in the same network. So one of these sites here is in Africa, which is a very interesting uh, western part of Africa, which is a very interesting region where you have a strong climatic gradient from the south here in Benin to the north in Mali. And this region has been instrumented uh, very heavily, uh, with a lot of parameters being measured, like uh, atmospheric parameters, ecological parameters, hydrological parameters, geological parameters, to try to understand something which has happened, very uh, a strong perturbation which has occurred in that region of the world, and you probably heard about that, which was that when you look at the long-term chronicle of uh, precipitation in that region of the world, between, uh, let's say, uh, 1975 and 1990, uh, uh, a, a big drought occurred. Uh, and I, I remember I was, I was young when this drought was uh, producing disasters, really disasters, with a lot of people dying, with a lot of economical damages, etc. This period is here, you see, and this is a precipitation record, okay? So you see that uh, before the drought, the precipitation were, were not bad, and, and then the big drought occurred. And what is interesting is that since the 90s, the precipitations have come came back in that region of the world, in the Sahel region, okay? Precipitation have came back, but something which is very important is to uh, realize that the precipitation patterns, which is uh, not the amount of precipitation, but the, the repartition of this precipitation through the year is very different. So in particular, now we have more extreme events. So we are in a, the amount of water is the same than it was before the drought, but the, the, the amount that the system is receiving per unit of time is very different. So you have more and more extreme events. And this is probably true at the global scale, a lot of more and more people think that the climate is going to change and that the occurrence of extreme events is going to be more and more important because we are changing the global climate machine. And what is interesting, for example, here, this is a hydrogram. So the hydrogram is the amount of water in the Niger River. So the Niger River is one of the biggest rivers of Africa. It is uh, crossing Niamey, which is the capital of the Niger. And in the past, and you can look at uh, this uh, curve here, in the past, this is, uh, so before the drought, I think it's, I'm sorry, the color are really bad, but in the past, the Niger used to have two flood events, okay? One occurring in, in uh, here, they, they, we used to call that the small flood, and one occurring here in February, so the first one was occurring at the end of the summer, and this one was occurring in February, and it was a big flood event, okay? And so all the city uh, and all the society were used to these two flood events, one small, one big. But with the new precipitation regime that started in the 19th, the small flood is becoming the big flood. And you do see that this is the, the discharge of the water, so the amount of the water in the river here, this, this curve here, and you do see that the big flood is now becoming what used to be the small flood, okay? So the system is changing, okay? The earth is responding to human actions, and, 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 the, and you see a situation where precipitation has, has came back, but, but, but the system has been changed. So this is typically on a local, a local place, which is responding to human actions in a way which was not predictable, okay? We, you could have imagined that, okay, the rain is coming back, so things are going to come back as they were before the drought. No, this is not the case, and this is because of the complex city of the uh, critical zone, the behavior, the global, uh, uh, the global behavior of the critical zone. So I'm, I'm not going to the details here, but you have a very strong, uh, very interesting, you can look at that if you are interested, 
the fact that the precipitation are becoming more and more extreme is causing more runoff. I don't know if you know what runoff is. It's uh, the fact that the water is not infiltrating. When it's raining too much, it doesn't have the time to infiltrate, and it's going straight to the river. So it's changing totally the flow path of water into the critical zone. So it's changing the whole system. Okay? It's changing the vegetation. It's changing the level of groundwater. And in that region of the world, all the society is based on the drinking water is taken from the wells. Okay? So if you change a little bit the, the system, the groundwater system, then you change everything and you destabilize the society. So it's a very interesting connection between nat natural processes, which has been changed by human actions, and the society. And there is another example that I want to show, which is in the Strengbar, Strengbar Basin in the Vosges Mountains, which is a really interesting place, um, uh, which was, uh, we, that we started to monitor in, uh, back to the 80s. Uh, I was young, I remember, and I grew up in that region, so I was very close to the issue. The issue was rain, uh, acid rain. Huh? And you, you're too young to know that, but uh, uh, at that time, the big issue was not climate change. It was acid rain, because acid rain was, det was destroying all the forests. Forest in the, in the east of France, forest in Czechoslovakia, forest in eastern Germany, etc. And you, you end up with this kind of forest where all the leaves and the needles were falling on the, on the ground because the, the forest was receiving a, a, a rain water was, whose pH was like one or two. The truths, the fishes in the streets were all dying. Okay? It was a major issue. Huh? Fortunately, this is an issue, an environmental issue that we, we, we solved. And we solved it by paying attention, paying attention to the uh, release of sulfuric acid by the industry. So essentially the Ruhr, the industry from the Ruhr region in Germany, was releasing at that time uh, uh, vapor in the atmosphere very rich in sulfuric acid. And then the sulfuric acid is a strong acid. It was dissolving into the rain and producing the acidity that was killing the ecosystem in the Vosges mountains. And so at that time, some of my colleagues decided to install, a, uh, install an observatory in one representative small catchment of the Vosges, which is called the Strengbar Basin. You may visit it if you're interested. It's a very highly instrumented place, not far from uh, Colmar in Erzas. And, and that is really impressive how the different disciplines have been collaborating on that particular site. And now we have long-term record. And just, just let me show you one record. Uh, it's, it's starting in 1986 and it's still running. I, I didn't put the more recent data, but we, have, we still have the data. And what it is, it is the concentration of sulfate into the river. It's not very complicated. The sulfate is not, doesn't exist in the rock here, in the bedrock of the mountain. So the sulfate is entirely coming from the rain, and it's crossing the system and, and reaching the river. Okay? So by monitoring the sulfate in the river, you get an idea of how the acidity of the rain, which is due again to sulfuric acid, is evolving. And that's pretty interesting. You see several things. First, you see that from that uh, early period to now, the sulfate decreasing, as the sulfate concentration has been steadily decreasing, which is a good news. Uh, I could have showed you the pH. I think I have the pH of the river, which is the acidity of the river. So the pH have increased. In other words, the acidity of the rivers, the river has decreased. The fish, fishes have come back. You now can hunt trout again in the streams of the Vosges mountains. And, and, and but you see that uh, there are several things interesting on that picture. F the first is that, okay, there is a steady de decrease, but you also see that there is, a, there is something which is more subtle, and you have some peaks here, meaning that this, we don't really understand why we have these peaks here. We don't know what these peaks is about. It's not coming from the atmosphere. It's a response of the system. So it's like, you know, you are here, and at some time your body is responding in a way that, uh, you know, the doctor didn't, an didn't anticipate. It's exactly the same metaphor here. So these uh, uh, waves here, we don't fully understand why there is this cyclicity here of the sulfate into the critical zone of the Strengbar Basin. 
first, and second, and I like to show that to my founders, look, if you, if you monitor the system for three years, three years is a, is a duration of a PhD, okay? You see nothing, okay? Only three years, you don't see, you don't, you don't see anything. You see, you see variation, but this is with, within the noise. So it's very important to get this very long-term record. Otherwise, it's impossible to say anything. There is another good example, you've heard about it probably, which is due to, uh, which is a record of the CO2, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which was um, uh, made under the, uh, to say, leadership, power of killing back to the 1950, when he tried to convince the founders uh, to measure the CO2 in the atmosphere and the Hawaiian, Hawaiian atmosphere. And all the founders were saying at that time, no, no, it's useless. We don't have money to buy uh, your probe to measure CO2. Why do you want to measure CO2? It's stupid, blah, blah, blah. And now everyone is using the evolution of CO2 in the atmosphere as a, as a proxy for the Anthropocene. So really, uh, it's important to get, uh, get long-term chronicles. Um, and if you are interested by uh, learning more about that, there is a movie that we have uh, done that you can download, uh, <coughs> download on the web page of the Oscar uh, Research uh, Infrastructure. So uh, to answer to the question, uh, how did scientists get organized? It's a pretty new initiative, but we are trying to get organized by building networks, by building infrastructures, by, by getting organized. And that's a really bad uh, thing that the scientific scientists today are not much better organized. And, and to my opinion, it's one of the reasons why politi politicians and scientists have so much difficulty in communicating. And I don't want to mention here the sad new of the last COP26 in Glasgow that just uh, finished yesterday and which, which will give basically nothing. No, no one is expecting nothing from these uh, meetings because in particular, I think the scientific community is very, very much divided into a multiple, uh, multiplicity of disciplines and that doesn't make a message very clear to the decision maker, which are relatively happy with that because they don't want to hear, you know, the message, which is uh, pretty catastrophic, actually. So what does it change? And I will finish by that. What does it change uh, uh, to, what does it change, sorry, to the Earth politics in the Anthropocene? Of course, uh, the critical zone, as I told you, is uh, critical for the scientists that, uh, like me, study the Earth, but it's also the habitat of humans. And so this is a, a zone we have to take care. And this notion of care is very important. It's critical, so I, I need to take care. And I liked this uh, picture here where you have, uh, this is representing the subtle critical zone holistic uh, view system. Uh, it's a subtle uh, equilibrium between atmosphere, biota, sediment, aquifer, lithosphere, and the soil in between, which were in kind of an equilibrium between the human perturbation. And human perturbation is even slightly uh, pushing the system, but totally destabilizing it. And remember the case of the uh, Western African uh, uh, Critical Zone Observatory, where uh, uh, the changes in the climate have, are producing big changes into the habitats of humans. And of course, we are um, taking care of the critical zone in a very bad way. We are eroding our soils. You, you need uh, 100,000 years to make such a soil, but to destroy it with conventional agriculture, it's only a matter of 10 or 20 years, okay? We are introducing in our soils uh, molecules which will remain for 1,000 years, maybe, yeah? And which are killing molecules. And of course, in big cities, everything has been done to uh, uh, build impervious surfaces, to avoid the water to infiltrate. So we are really suppressing the life of the critical zone, okay? And not to talk about the phosphorus, I over, already, already talked to you about that. So a couple of slides showing that the situation is, is, I mean, the perturbation that humans are imposing to the system is not small, it's huge. I don't want to spend too much time on that. This is just pictures. 
This is one of the view of one of the critical zone observatory. Now that the sun has, has disappeared, we have nice light. Uh, so this is one of the of, of observatories in the Haute-Provence, in the south of France, in the Alps. You may be interested by visit it uh, if you want. Uh, I have colleagues here which are working all day, uh, trying to monitor things. And so you may find that beautiful, OK? Or you may, you may think, wow, wow, that's gorgeous. No, it's not. This is degradation, you know? Uh, if you go back one century or two centuries ago, everything was grassland. But because we have, we have loaded too much cows, too much pasture on that land, the land collapsed, okay? And now we're not able to come back. We stopped pa pa pasturing just because the people are not living there anymore. And why is there no people anymore there? Because we destroyed the critical zone, okay? So this is typically an habitat which is now totally empty, but which is the ruins of the human occupation, okay? And I don't know if you have read this book, but there's a wonderful book by Anna Tsing uh, on the ruins of the capitalism, the, the story of the Matsutake mushroom, which is a very nice story about uh, what we are forced to live in in the Anthropocene. So, uh, yeah, and this is, I could, I could spend the, the whole afternoon showing you, you know, disaster <laughs> pictures. I don't want to be too pessimistic. There is a colleague of mine which wrote a book, if you're interested by, by the critical zone, you may, you may read or even uh, listen to him on, the, on his YouTube channel, which is really interesting. So this is uh, Mon David Montgomery, and he wrote a book, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilization. Uh, so the title Dirt is very interesting. He, he could have uh, called his book The Soils, but nobody would have, would have bought it, you know? Soils is bo soil is boring stuff, but the dirt, this is exactly when you touch my rock, your, your hands were dirty, you know? Dirt. This is the erosion of civilization. And so he uh, produced, a, uh, uh, produced a graph which is very, very uh, famous now, which is he, com he compiled the uh, physical erosion rate. So this is the amount in millimeter per year, this is the natural numbers uh, of uh, the critical zone um, uh, erosion, okay? This is in that place here, here and here, this is the natural numbers, okay? So bouclier means um, uh, the flat areas uh, in the world. So for example, Canada or Scandinavia here, Colline, Colline mean hills and zone alpine, as you guess, alpine zones. Okay, and without any surprise, when you have more slope, steeper slope, the erosion, so the amount of material that is uh, basically transported by the rivers is higher. This is natural processes, okay? But look, then he compiled also the numbers characterizing the places where humans have made agriculture, intensive agriculture, okay? Conventional <laughs> agriculture, I like this term conventional. And look, we are now uh, provoking an erosion of the soil, okay, which is in the same order as, uh, or even higher than what we get in the alpine zone. Men, man, the, the action of man is to reproduce the action of the slope, what you get in high mountains. And you can make a very simple calculation that David is doing. In one century, we won't have any soils left. And what will we do without size? Nothing. So this is where the critical zone becomes a very interesting political object. So uh, uh, I had just a couple of slides because I told you I'm not a, a social scientist. I'm not a politics science person. But what does the concept of critical zone change to the Earth's politics? So, as I told you, the critical zone is a human habitat. There is no exterior, okay? We are confined in that zone, okay? There's no way we can escape. And maybe one guy called Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, but it's, 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 it's a stupid idea, okay? We were born in the critical zone as humans. We are forced to live in the critical zone. There is no way we can escape. We are part of the system, okay? And this is a very different view from the view that eventually Mr. Musk is trying to figure out, okay? We are in the critical zone. We are one of the drivers. And then immediately you come to the Gaia hypothesis. Huh? And the Gaia hypothesis is to say that 
the critical zone is the materiality of Gaia. Okay? This is where Gaia is trying to act, okay? to make it possible for, the, for life to survive on the planet. Okay? And if you think about Gaia as a self-organizing thing, then immediately you should say that humans, if they are part of Gaia, should behave in the same way as plants have behaved, as bacteria, cyan cyanobacteria have behaved in the past. Look at what cyan cyan cyanobacteria did uh, two or three million years ago. They, pr they invented a reaction that totally polluted the atmosphere. They invented photosynthesis, and the waste of photosynthesis is oxygen. Before the invention of photosynthesis by, by, by bacteria, by these bacteria, the atmosphere of the Earth was containing no oxygen. And suddenly, these bacteria invented this new uh, business, industry, let's say, and then the atmosphere of the oxygen become, became oxygenated. They, they were happy with that because they were co oxygen compatible. But a lot of other species just disappeared forever. Oh, not forever. They still exist, but they are in the bottom of the ocean. They are deep in the rocks today because they try to escape from the oxygen. You could even say, in, in a Gaia view, you could say that human species is another species which is changing the whole system. But if we are reasonable, we should tend toward a state where we are protecting our environment, okay, in a Gaian way. I'm not sure this is the way we are, uh, the trajectory that we are on today, okay? And so uh, Gaia is a very interesting theory. If you're not familiar with that, you could read the, the books uh, of Lovelock. They're now old. Uh, this is a French version, but you, but you can find, uh, you can find uh, English versions, of course. So the critical zone is a self-regulating layer. It's a materiality uh, of Gaia. Okay? I don't want to come back on the arguments of Gaia. I don't have time, but just to mention that uh, very often when we talk about Gaia, we mention James Lovelock, but James Lovelock was not the only one. He was, uh, his co-author was Lynn Margulis, which was a, who was a, she was a wonderful woman. I, 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 um, you should be interested by the way uh, this scientist uh, organized uh, his career because she's really, really an impressive uh, woman and she wrote two books, really. She worked a lot on the idea of symbiosis. The symbiosis is, is, is when two organisms are dependent each other and she was seeing um, uh, the microorganisms that I've talked about uh, earlier in the talk, which are living in the deep biosphere, as the main agents uh, regulating the Earth. So she was not giving an importance to the Amazonian forest, the way we do it today, but she was giving the importance to the microorganism that we don't even see, okay, which are beneath our feet. And, and she wrote a number of very interesting books. There is a movie uh, which is not uh, available on, on, uh, on YouTube, unfortunately, and I don't uh, find the title here. Uh, but which is absolutely, uh, absolutely fantastic to, to watch. It's, it's a life of Lynn Margulis. And I think she, she, deserved, she deserves more attention. She's really, really exceptional. And so, uh, and then what does the other arguments for uh, the Earth's politics and the critical zone? What is interesting, as I showed you in the critical zone science, is that we need an alliance. We need an alliance of natural sciences of ecology, of geology, but we need also to need to an alliance with sociology, with anthropology, I should have mentioned economics and politics, okay? There is no way humans can survive on the planet without building these aliens, and not to separate nature on one side and culture on the other side, huh? and saying, okay, okay, we have destroyed nature, but we're going to restore it. To me, restoration is the worst concept. Uh, ever invented, you know? You break something and then you say, okay, my thought, I'm going to repair it. No, it's not the way it is. We have to see us as part of the system and to be self-evolving with the, with the system. Another thing which is really important for politics, with the, with the critical zone, as I showed you, is that the critical zone is place-based. It's all, it's, it's not global, okay? There's no way 
you can model the critical zone on the global scale. Doesn't make sense. Everything is different depending on where you are. And so you have to compose okay, the world with an infinite uh, diversity of situations. Okay? And so we have to come back, we have to land, as Bruno Latour very often says, to down to earth, okay? come back, come back on the earth, to describe it, to try to understand it, to describe the relationship between humans and their environment and not separate nature from one side and culture on the other uh, side. And there is one example, you may be interested by that, the, the bioregionalism project, there are books on the bioregionalism project, which I think is interesting and which is a way of, um, how to say, uh, selling the idea of the critical zone uh, from a scientific point of view to practical way of uh, inhabiting the earth. And so if you want to read things on the critical zone and the political implication on the critical zone, I have selected a number of links here. So you have uh, this book, which is, uh, as I already mentioned, the catalog of the exhibition critical zone, which is uh, now in Karlsruhe. So you can read it. It's a really heavy book. Huh? Uh, <laughs> it's heavy and it's long. So uh, uh, you need to, to organize yourself if you want to pick up some uh, articles in that book. But what is interesting is that book is composed of several parts. And it's including scientists. I, I, I wrote a paper in that book. Uh, artists. Uh, it was a unique occasion for me to work with artists. It was a wonderful occasion. Uh, social scientists, polit politicians, uh, philosophers, philosophers. Okay, really interesting. Uh, there is also, uh, uh, yeah, you can download uh, the introduction of that book, which is a paper from Latour, which is Seven Objections Against Landing on Earth, which is about uh, his political view of the critical zone. And, and, and you can uh, go and to, the, to the web and uh, you can visit actually virtually the exhibition, uh, which is which is not good, but which is not, uh, which is not bad uh, as well. Uh, and so if you're interested, you can read, uh, and again, if you have time, the books that uh, Bruno Latour wrote about the critical zone. I have selected uh, these three, three books. Uh, they have been translated into English, not maybe the last one, but Où atterrir has been translated into uh, uh, Down to Earth, okay? Uh, down to Earth, Politics in the New Climatic Regime. Um, and you have a quotation here from one of these books, which is a situation not only allows many different disciplines to collaborate, it also opens politically many alternative courses of action that the face-to-face -face of human and nature doesn't allow. Okay, so this is the change of regime introduced by the critical zone. In that sense, the notion of the critical zone is much less paralyzing for politics than that of the Anthropocene. Uh, this is an interesting uh, quotation. And so if you are interested, you will find, I will give you this, uh, this PDF. Huh? You will find some of the references here, which are scientific, I mean natural scientific and, and social scientist uh, references. So the critical zone has become, has become, sorry, a concept in social sciences, humanity and arts. I'm even myself very surprised to discover publications talking about uh, my, uh, my object of study. Um, I don't even recognize my, uh, my object of study. It's interesting. And this is two uh, YouTube, um, YouTube videos that uh, you may be interested by, uh, by uh, looking at. Uh, Bruno Latour, which you know is a little bit provocative for, uh, for the humanities, at least for the French humanities, often says that uh, the critical zone is getting the humanities out of the box. Uh, and you have uh, Frédéric Atouati, which is uh, collaborating with um, Bruno on the critical zone. They have produced, there is a nice uh, uh, online conference of, on this notion of critical zone that you may be uh, interesting to uh, look at. And so I'm uh, finishing with my take-home messages uh, that I'm not going to, to read. It's just a wrap-up uh, of what I've, I have said. And I thank you very much. <laughs>